quick, world events show that Christ will return. In starting a talk like this, what we would normally do is we would normally look at verses which clearly indicate that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. And it is said that there are in the Bible more than 300 verses which in fact refer to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in starting our talk this evening, rather than look at some of the verses which we would normally look at, I thought we would take a slightly different approach and we would look at the verses which our chairman has just read for us from Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 to 23. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in understanding the Bible, it often helps if we know what the background to the verses are. And so we're going to start this evening by having a look at the background to those verses, the background to Zechariah chapter 8, verses 18 to 23. And at the time that is referred to in these verses, the world power, the predominant kingdom on the earth was the Babylonian kingdom, which was ruled over by a king by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of the Babylon, uh, was the king of the Babylonians. And on the map which is before us on this screen, we have the territory outlined which the Babylonian kingdom occupied at that time. You'll see that it says near the bottom of the slide, Babylonian Empire, about 560 BC. And the events which we're going to look at in a moment occurred around 600 BC. So you can see that's an accurate map of the Babylonian Empire and its territory at the time of this prophecy of Zechariah chapter 8. Now it also follows that because that was the territory of the Babylonian Empire, that the land of Israel, and in particular the kingdom of Judah, came under the domination of the Babylonians and under the domination of King Nebuchadnezzar. And of course the capital of the kingdom of Judea or the kingdom of Judah was the city of Jerusalem and in that city there existed a magnificent temple which had been built for the worship of the God of heaven built by Solomon and it was an absolutely magnific magnificent structure. So that's the background to Zechariah chapter 8 verses 18 to 23. The dominant world power was Babylon. It had overrun the kingdom of Judah in the land of Israel. It had, uh, in fact, surrounded the city of Jerusalem and so forth. And as I say, that in fact forms the background to these verses which we are now going to look at. So we'll start in Zechariah chapter 8 and we read in verse 18, And the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness, and cheerful feasts, therefore love the truth and peace. So what we can see from those two verses is that there were four annual fasts. There were four annual fasts. And these fast days were instituted by the Jewish people so that they might remember the calamities the distresses, the troubles which overtook them at the time of the Babylonian invasion of the Kingdom of Judah by Nebuchadnezzar in about the year 600 BC. 
Now, these fasts were held in the month that the calamity occurred, that is, in the fourth, fifth, seventh, and tenth months of the year. Chronologically, the events occurred in the following order, the tenth month, then the fourth month, then the fifth month, and then the seventh month. And we're going to look briefly at what these fasts commemorated. And so we'll start with the fast of the tenth month. And the fast in the tenth month recalled the beginning of the siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in the tenth month of the ninth year of the reign of Judah's last king, and his name was King Zedekiah. And so if we come to Jeremiah chapter 52 uh, and verses 4 and 5, this is what we read, and it's on the slide. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, which is another name for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem and pitched against it and built forts against it round about. So the city of Jerusalem was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. So that's what the fast of the tenth month commemorated. That's what it reminded the Jews about. It reminded the Jews that King Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, came into the land and besieged the city of, the, of Jerusalem. So that was one of the fasts which we have mentioned in Zechariah chapter 8. Well, then we have the fast which occurred in the fourth month. And this fast recalled the two years siege of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar from the ninth to the eleventh year of Zedekiah's reign which resulted in severe food shortages in Jerusalem and the eventual breaching of the city walls by Nebuchadnezzar and the capture of the Jewish king, King Zedekiah. We read of that in the Bible outside Zechariah chapter 8 in Jeremiah chapter 52 and verses 6 to 8, which says, And in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the famine was sore in the city, so that there was no bread for the people of the land. Then the city was broken up, and all the men of war fled and went forth out of the city by night. But the army of the Chaldees, or the Bar army of the Babylonians, pursued after King Zedekiah and overtook him in the plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. And so that's what the fast of the fourth month commemorated. It commemorated the breaking down of the walls of Jerusalem and the capture of Zedekiah and so forth. And so the fast which the Jews held in that month reminded them of that calamity which overtook them in the days when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came down. All right, they also held a fast in the fifth month. And the fast in the fifth month recalled the burning of Solomon's wonderful temple and the destruction of the houses of the, of the prominent men in Jerusalem and the breaking, further breaking down of the walls of the city. And we read of that in Jeremiah chapter 52, verses 12 to 14. Now in the fifth month, in the tenth day of the month, which was the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, which served the king of Babylon into Jerusalem and burned the house of the Lord, burned Solomon's temple and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem and all the houses of the great men burned he with fire and all the army of the Babylonians or the Chaldeans that were with the captain of the guard, break down all the walls of Jerusalem round about. And so here was another calamity. And the Jews instituted this fast in the fifth month to remind them of this calamity 
where the temple, the wonderful temple, the magnificent temple which Solomon had built for the worship of the God of heaven was in fact destroyed by the Babylonians. All right, the fourth fast is the fast of the seventh month. And before Nebuchadnezzar departed from Judah, before he took the captives back to Babylon and left some of the Jews in the land, of course, he appointed a Jew called Gedaliah to be governor of the land. However, within two months of Nebuchadnezzar appointing Gedaliah and those associated with him to control the kingdom of Judah that Nebuchadnezzar had captured, Gedaliah and those associated with him were assassinated by a band of faithful Jews led by a man called Ishmael. And this is what the fast in the seventh month commemorated. We read of that in Jeremiah chapter 41, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Elishama, of the seed royal, and the princes of the king, even ten men with him, came unto Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim, and to Mizpah. And there they did eat bread together in Mizpah. Then arose Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men that were with him, and smote Gedaliah the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and slew him, whom the king of Babylon had made governor over the land. So there was yet another catastrophe. The Jewish person whom Nebuchadnezzar had appointed to run affairs after he returned to Babylon, within two months of him being appointed, he was slain. And so the Jews had these fasts that reminded them of the calamities, the distress, the, the difficulties which occurred at this time when King Nebuchadnezzar had come down into the land. So here were the fasts in summary. These four annual fasts reminded the Jews of the heartbreak, the tragedy, the distress, the starvation, the assassination, the desolation and defeat as the king of Babylon invaded the kingdom of Judah. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, religious Jews still keep those four fasts today. Religious Jews in the world today still look back, they still keep those four fasts, and they remember these calamities, these distresses that came upon them at that time. But, you notice what Zechariah said. Zechariah said, or says, that the sorrows commemorated by these fasts will be replaced by joy, by gladness, and cheerful feasts. Now, a feast is, of course, exactly the opposite of a fast. So there's a time coming when the Jewish people will no longer look back on the calamities which overtook their nation in the days of King Nebuchadnezzar. They won't look back on those days anymore and feel distressed about them because their fasts, says Zechariah, are going to be replaced by joyful, glad feasts. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will occur after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to establish God's kingdom upon the earth. So you see, we have started our lecture in the way we would normally start it. We have started our lecture by drawing attention to the fact that many times in the Bible, and Zechariah 8 is one of them, we have this prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. He's going to intervene in the affairs of the world. And in this particular case, the sorrow of the Jews over what happened 600 years before the birth of Christ are going to be replaced. They're not going to remember the sorrows anymore because with the righteous reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he has returned to establish God's king upon the earth and to rule from Jerusalem over a new temple that will be built there, 
will completely wipe away, as it were, all the sorrows of those fasts which they still keep unto this day. All right, let's proceed a little further in Zechariah chapter 8. Because in verse 20 it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Now, ladies and gentlemen, since the time that Zechariah penned those words, the words which he was inspired to speak by Almighty God, the events which those verses relate to or relate or talk about, that is Zechariah 8 verses 20 to 22, have never been fulfilled. They've never been fulfilled. <clears throat> you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, and we'll look at that in a moment, he's going to build a house of prayer for all people far more magnificent than the temple which existed in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and was destroyed in the city of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar. A far more magnificent temple. And what we can see from that verses, those verses 20 to 22 of Zechariah chapter 8, that the nations of the world, the inhabitants of one city, shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also, yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. So you see, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, what he's going to do is Jerusalem is going to be established as the capital of the kingdom of God. And an absolutely magnificent temple is going to be built there, virtually, if you like, to replace the one that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed 600 years before the birth of the Lord. Now, of course, Zechariah chapter 8 is not the only place in the Bible by any stretch of the imagination which speaks about that wonderful time. Isaiah also speaks of this joyful time. And we read in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the last days, I'd like you to remember that phrase because we're going to come back to an expression like that a little later on. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations, notice it, all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Reminiscent, isn't it, of the words of Zechariah chapter 8. Many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion, out of Mount Zion at Jerusalem, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, ruling on behalf of God, he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Now I have remarked on a number of occasions so far this evening, that the temple which the Lord Jesus Christ, the house of prayer which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to build at Jerusalem, will be a far more magnificent place or house of prayer or place of worship than that which existed when in the days of Zedekiah when Nebuchadnezzar came down. The Solomon's temple was 
erected on Mount, Zo on, uh, Mount Moriah, which is a, a small area in Jerusalem. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, there are going to be massive topographical changes to the area around Jerusalem. And he's going to build a house of prayer. He's going to build a temple. And the details of that temple are set out for us in the closing chapters of the prophecy of Ezekiel. And we want, what we know about it is that while Solomon's temple was a fairly small temple on a small area within the city of Jerusalem, the temple which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to erect at the area of Jerusalem around Mount Zion is in fact 1.6 kilometres square. 1.6 kilometres square. So it's a magnificent temple. It's a temple which will serve the worship needs of the mortal population of the earth who will make annual pilgrimages up to Jerusalem to worship in that place. So you see, the message of the Bible is consistent. It is absolutely consistent. And furthermore, the Jewish people who today are despised, and as we know, anti-Semitism is on the rise, their status as mortal people in the kingdom of God, their status will be elevated far above any status which they have in the world today. And so in the final verse of Zechariah chapter 8, in verse 23, we read this, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. I don't think, ladies and gentlemen, that there's many people or perhaps hardly any person in the world today that would look at the Jewish nation and they might say, well, God has done wonderful things for that nation. But you would know if you knew your Bible and you knew how the Jews worship that they are in fact not worshipping the God of heaven. Their worship is not pure. They need to be converted. They need to be changed and they will be changed with the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the converted, the converted Jewish people will be respected when Christ reigns over the earth from Jerusalem. And with the house of prayer in the midst of Israel, around what we know today as the city of Jerusalem, then of course the, the Jewish people will have a special relationship, mortal relationship, with that wonderful temple which will, be, which will be erected there by the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. All right, well, we have said on a number of occasions this evening that the Lord Jesus Christ is, is coming. And that raises the question, how long is it to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? How long is it? And the right answer to that is, that we do not know exactly. We do not know exactly. And as a matter of fact, there are hundreds and hundreds of predictions which have occurred during the history of mankind where they have set dates for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one, of course, has failed because the Lord Jesus Christ still hasn't come. But what we, what we don't know exactly when he is coming, what we do know is that time is running out. Time is running out, and we're going to see how it's running out in just a minute. We are living, ladies and gentlemen, in what we might describe as the end time period. We are living in the end time period. And you know, there have been end time periods in the past, and we might just look at some of them. For example, at the time of the flood in Noah's day, about 2,300 years before the birth of Christ, there was an end time period. If you've got your Bible on your lap, you might like to open it as we read together 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 6. 2 Peter 
chapter 3 and verse 6. This is what Peter says in that place. He's talking about the flood of Noah's day. And, of course, God intervened in the affairs of men and sent that flood. And Peter expresses it this way, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Here was an end time period. At that time, all the population of the world, apart from eight people, perished in the flood. It was the end of the period. It was an end time period for those people. There was another end time period after the Jews crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And in AD 70, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar that came down, of course, because that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians weren't a world power at that time, but it was the Romans who were the world power. But it was another end time period, this time an end time period for the Jewish nation before they were scattered completely throughout the earth. So if you come with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we're going to see that here we have another end time period. And so the writer of the Hebrews says in verse 1 of chapter 1, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, by the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. So you see, there were these last days days that are spoken of. It was an end time period for the Jewish people because in AD 70 the Romans were going to come down. They were in fact going to destroy a rebuilt temple which replaced the one which Solomon had made and Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. And so history in that sense was going to repeat itself. It was an end time period for the Jewish people. Here described isn't uh, in, in these words in these last days. And ladies and gentlemen, there's an end time period which affects us. We're living in an end time period. We're living in a period when God again is going to intervene in the affairs of men. And so if you come back to the 21st chapter of the Gospel record by Luke, we read in verse 24, and they, and it's talking about the Jewish people, they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations. Now that was the end time period for them. They're currently being regathered in accordance with Bible prophecy. But for 2,000 years, the majority of them have been scattered throughout all the nations of the earth. So that's what's being spoken of in verse 24. That's the end time period for the Jewish people. They, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. But notice what it then says. And Jerusalem, that's the city of Jerusalem, shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In 1967, when in the Six-Day War, the city of Jerusalem, by and large, by and large, came back into Jewish hands, having been in Gentile hands basically since AD 70. Now, it's not completely in Jewish hands, but it's 99% or 95% or something like that in Jewish hands. The most holy site in the city of Jerusalem is still dominated by Gentiles, where you've got the Dome of the Rock and the El Aska Mosque and so on. You've got that false worship set up, in the, set up in the city. But for the first time, basically since AD 70, in 1967, the city of Jerusalem, apart from that area which I have just spoken about, came back into Jewish hands. And notice what Luke says. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. 
We are living in the times of the Gentiles, ladies and gentlemen, and we're living in an end time period. The times of the Gentiles are fast running out. That is what the Bible teaches us. What we are now also able to do is we're able to look back at the end time periods which we have been speaking about and we're able to look at the conditions which existed in those end time periods. So if we go back to the flood of Noah's day and we can see what the population was like before God sent his judgment upon the world at that time and the end came for all the population of the world apart from the eight who were saved. So in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1 we read, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all that they chose. And so what was happening was that the population was irreligious. The population entered into unholy marriages. If you go down that chapter, you'll find there was violence and so forth and so on. It wasn't a God-fearing society. That was, that was the condition in that end time period. Let's have a look at verses 5 and 6, which tells us some more about it. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. You want to see the violence? You've got that recorded in verse 11. And the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. They were the conditions, ladies and gentlemen, at that end time period. And I suggest to you, if you look out on our world today, we're living in the end time period of the Gentiles, and you can see the same sort of attitudes developing well and truly. Our world is irreligious. Our world enters into unholy marriages. Our, the people of the world, the population of the world, are largely evil intentioned. Violence is increasing. So the very conditions which existed on the earth in the end time period in Noah's day, in fact, are being replicated in our own. Let's now look at Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. And we're going to talk at the end time periods so far as they relate to the Gentiles are concerned. And we read this. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. Men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things that are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Let's go back to the opening of those two verses. There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there are people who, when they read those words, think that what is being spoken about is some literal event which is going to take place so far as the sun and the moon and the stars are concerned. They look to the heavens and if there's some meteor meteorite or Halley's comment or whatever, it's all. There's a sign of Christ's coming that is not what is being spoken about in those, in those, uh, in the, in, in those words. Well, just have a look. You see, when you read the Bible, and when you read it from beginning to end, then as you go along, you pick up ideas. If you go in at Luke chapter 21, and that's where you start your Bible reading, then you might be confused about what sun, moon, and stars really mean. But you see, sun, moon, and stars are used figuratively in the Bible. The heavens equate to the people who rule as the heavens are above the earth. So when we're looking at governments and so forth, the kings and so forth, they're over the people. 
So the heavens are the governing authorities. The earth is the people who are ruled. Now let's have a look at a couple of examples of this. If you come back in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 1, Give ear, O ye heavens. How, ladies and gentlemen, can the heavens hear? Have they got ears? No, of course they haven't. But you see, it's not literal. The heavens are the rulers. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth. Can the earth hear? Has it got the capacity to listen, the literal earth, and understand? No, of course it hasn't. But that's not what's being spoken about. The heavens are the ruling authorities. The earth are the people who are ruled. If you come across to another example of the same thing in the prophecy of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we read this. The, word, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah, the Jews if you like, and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Then verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. Who is being commanded to pay attention? The literal heavens and the literal earth? No, not at all. The rulers and the ruled. Now you can see that that in fact is the idea by coming down to verse 10 in that same chapter, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. So when it comes to verse 10, it doesn't say, Hear, O heavens. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. So you see, the heavens represent the rulers, the earth represents the people who are ruled. So that symbology, heavens and earth, is expanded in the Bible. And so then you have references to the sun, moon and stars. And the sun, moon and stars are the rulers in an ordered ruling system. They represent the kings, the presidents, the prime ministers, the priests, the nobles, the judges, the magistrates, etc. They're the heavens, and breaking it down, they're the sun, moon, and stars, which are often referred to in the Bible, not as something literal, but as figurative of the rulers in an ordered ruling system. And as the civil and religious rulers, they govern the people as the sun and moon do the earth. The sun affects what happens on the earth. The moon affects what happens on the earth, you see. And so that is the idea which we have there. So in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to establish upon the earth, there will be new figurative heavens and earth. While we have our Bibles open in Isaiah, if we come across to Isaiah 65 and verse 17, this is what God says. Isaiah 65 and verse 17, Behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Is God going to destroy the heavens which are above us, the stars, the sun, the moon, and so forth? Not at all. Is this earth upon which we live going to be destroyed? No. In fact, the Bible absolutely contradicts that. We tell, it tells us the meek shall inherit the earth. But you see, here it's not talking about a literal heaven. It's not talking about a literal earth. What it's saying is that when the kingdom of God is established, there will be a new righteous government. The rulers will be righteous. The rulers will be God-fearing. The rulers will do the right thing. The people will hear the word of God. The earth will hear the word of God. They're going to be regenerated by the teaching and acceptance of the doctrines which the Lord Jesus Christ and those associated with him will set forth as the policy matters of the kingdom. So, just following up on that a little further, the Lord Jesus Christ is referred to, in fact, as the Son, S-U-N. 
is also the S-O-N, but for example, if we take the prophecy in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2, it says this, But unto you that fear my name shall not S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness, arise with healing in his wings. That Son of Righteousness is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Son of the Kingdom in that sense. And he's going to be a strong ruler. So that if we go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, in chapter 1 and verse 16, we read this. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, you see. So again, the Lord Jesus Christ, or the sun, represents the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And, and this is a wonderful message for us, ladies and gentlemen, if we are associated with the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom as his immortal associates, then we are likened to stars. And Daniel mentions that in the 12th chapter of Daniel uh, and at verse 2 and 3. Daniel chapter 12 and verses 2 and 3. And this is talking about the kingdom. And we read in verse 2, And many of them, this is the resurrection, resurrection which will take place at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And many of them asleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise, and that's what we've got to be now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to make sure we are wise people. We are Bible students. We understand what God wants. That's who the wise are. And they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So you see, when you're talking about heavens and earth, when you're talking about sun, moon and stars, you've got to be careful to see whether it's talking about something literal or whether it's using figurative language. So let's read Luke 21 again. And there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and stars, in the political heavens, the political uh, systems which exist around us, ladies and gentlemen. That's what it's being spoken about. And there's going to be signs in them, and there are already signs in them, aren't there? And you've got to look what's happened in the United States of America in the last week or so to see signs, some signs, in the heavens. So... There shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity. A word which really means with no way out. And that's the situation into which the world is getting itself. The sea and the waves warring. And Isaiah says the wicked are like a troubled sea. And that's our earth. That's the people who live on the earth. The vast majority of them are wicked. The wicked are like a troubled sea which cast out mire and dirt. So there's going to be signs in the political heavens, in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations. Increasingly, they're going to find there's no way out of the problems which face them, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, then shall they see the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. All right, so we've been talking about conditions at end time periods. And I suppose in the lecture which is being delivered late in January 2021, one could not help but make some brief reference to the insurrection which was attempted in the Washington the capital of the United States of America on the 6th of January this year. And that's what happens. Men and women get totally unbalanced about their beliefs and what they think should happen. And then the most atrocious uh, atrocities occur. All right. All right. So, we set out this evening to say something about signs of Christ's coming. 
Now, what I find interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is this, that I have been a member of this congregation for 30 years. When I came, there was a sign by the entry door to our hall. It's not there at the moment, and the reason it's not there is because we've had to make some adjustments because of COVID restrictions, but the sign is still there. And when you go to supper this evening, if you look in the supper room, you'll find it. And this is what that sign actually says. Now, I'm not going to go through them all bit by bit because these are matters which we deal with regularly from our platform, from this platform of a Sunday evening. Uh, but that placard that we had there, and it's been there for 30 years, says that Christ's return is assured by world events. What world events? Well, the revival of Israel. The revival of Israel. And we have seen the revival of Israel. If you have some reasonable age on you, you will remember when Israel became a state again in 1948. You'll remember the Jews gradually started to go back to the land. And so we've seen the revival of Israel, which is required by Bible prophecy. This is a partial and primary restoration of the Jewish people. is required by Bible prophecy before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will know that in Ezekiel chapter 38, it speaks about the rise of Russia, Russia being named in the Bible under the Hebrew name of Rosh. And Russia has risen as a world power since World War II. You'll know that in the book of Revelation, it speaks about the drying up of the river Euphrates, which is a symbol of the Turkish Empire. Why? So that the way of the kings of the East might be prepared. And the kings of the East are the Lord Jesus Christ and his immortal associates. And we've seen that happen. We see the world increasingly being divided into two camps, as is required by Daniel chapter 2. As I mentioned earlier in this talk, we see Jerusalem freed again. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now that won't have its complete fulfilment, I don't believe, until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, we can see an incipient fulfilment in what has taken place in our own days in the world. A dramatic increase in technology and rapid transport. And so it is. Rapid transport might be slowed down a bit at the moment because of the COVID-19 crisis, but nevertheless, people before that were tearing all over the world. I think there are now aircraft which can fly from Australia to the United Kingdom non-stop, non-stop. There is dramatic increase in technology and rapid transport as is required by Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4. We see international distress and perplexity. We've seen some of that, as I've mentioned. It's only a small part of it. We've seen some of that in what's happened in Washington, D.C. on the 6th of January this year. We've seen growth of violence, crime and related social issues, as is required by 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we've seen growing rejection of divine revelation and godly principles. And that's happening all the time. I'm not going to mention one... But those of you who read the press will know that the Tasmanian government, and is expected to be followed by the West Australian government, is going to introduce laws which are directly opposed to what the Bible teaches. Of course, there's not just one, set, one group of laws or one law which, which they've introduced which are directly opposed to what the Bible teaches, but this they're increasing, all right? They, they are increasing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is assured. His coming is assured. How long to his coming? Well, as I said a moment ago, we don't know exactly. What we do know is that time is running out. We are living in the end time period. And because that is true, for us especially, ladies and gentlemen, we need to prepare for Christ's coming. We need to do that in order that we might be with him when he reigns as king over the earth 
in God's glorious kingdom, which Christ is coming to establish here upon the earth. We trust that you will make the Bible your study and that you will indeed prepare for that glorious time which is coming on earth when Christ returns to reign.